Hello, today we're continuing in our series on uh, nuclear physics and we're going to be looking specifically at spin orbit coupling. Now I should say that this video is really a follow-on to the video that I did on the shell model. So if you haven't seen that it would be worth stopping and watching that now because this video is going to develop the idea in the shell model about why you get split levels. Um, and you won't know what I'm talking about if you haven't seen the shell model video. Before we look at the nuclear forces, let's once again go back to atomic physics and look at what happens with electrons in what's called the Bohr model. Now we know that for electrons there are four quantum numbers, n, l, m and s, that's the principal quantum number, the orbital angular momentum quantum number, the magnetic quantum number and the spin quantum number. N can have values, integer values, 1, 2, 3, and so on. L has integer values of 0 up to N minus 1. Those, and that gives rise to the S, P, D, and F, and so on. Thereafter it goes G, H, I um, levels. When L is 0, it's an S, spherical. When L is 1, it's P, which is non-spherical. It's kind of the dumbbell shape. When L is 2, that's D. When L is 3, that's F, and so on. M, the magnetic quantum number, has integer values from minus L up to 0 up to plus L. And spin, as we know, is a half or minus half, or if you like, up or down. Now, in the Bohr model, the original Bohr model, we just looked at the N values, because nobody actually knew anything about the other quantum values at that time. And what we're saying is that the electron sits in a potential well. Why? Because there's a positive nucleus and it's a negatively charged electron. So there is an attractive Coulomb force between the two. That creates a potential which binds the electron to the atom. So there's a binding energy. And if you look at hydrogen, which is of course the simplest atom of all, one proton, one electron, what you find is that in its ground state, where n equals 1, the binding energy, or sometimes called the work function, is minus 13.6 electron volts. Minus because it's bound. Actually, 0 is up here. This is 0. If you can get above 0, you are a free electron. So if you give this electron in the ground state 13.6 eV of energy, it can escape from the atom. But if you don't give it that much, it can't. And minus 13.6 eV is sometimes called the Rydberg constant, so we'll call that R. Now, we showed that um, you get higher levels as n increases. <clears throat> but the depth of the potential varies as 1 over n squared. So when n is 2, you're actually at one quarter, one over n squared, one over, one over two squared of the value of r. When you're at n equals three, <coughs> this is n equals three, that is going to be one ninth of the value of r, one over three squared. When n is four, I'll do this side now, n equals four, that's going to be one sixteenth of the value of r which is 13.6 eV. Uh, when n is 5, that's going to be 1 25th of the value of R. And when n is 6, that's 1 36th of the value of R. Now, there will be an infinite number of uh, these lines until you get to E equals 0. But they are increasingly closer together. You can see what's happening. The first jump, 75% of the, uh, of the total depth has to be covered just to get from n equals 1 to n equals 2. But then they get closer and closer and closer together. And what we said was that if you take an electron in the ground state and you give it some energy by heating it maybe, uh, by um, passing electric current, you give the electron some energy, it can jump up to the next energy level. I mean, if you give it enough energy, it can escape the atom, and then the atom is said to be ionised because it loses an electron. But let's suppose we give it enough energy to jump up to the next energy level. 
It won't want to stay there. It will want to return to the lowest energy. Nature always does. And so after a while, very short while actually, the electron will fall back to the lower energy. But this is higher, higher energy than this, so it will need to give off energy as it does so. And it gives off an amount delta E, which is the difference between this energy level and this energy level. Well, we know the difference. This is 13.6. This is a quarter of 13.6. So the difference is three quarters of 13.6 EV. That is the energy. And that comes off in the form of a photon. A packet of energy. This is where quantized concepts come from. There's a packet, a quantized amount of energy in this photon equal to H nu, where nu is now the frequency of the light of which the photon is a part. Now, depending on the extent of the energy gap, that, since H is a constant, that will determine the value of nu, the frequency. So the energy is increases so does the frequency increase. And for a large jump, for example, from n equals two to n equals one, that is such a large jump that what you will find is that in that case, nu is in the ultraviolet range of the electromagnetic spectrum. And unless you've got special equipment, you can't see that. By contrast, if you go from say six to five, that is such a small jump, delta E is so small, that the frequency is very small, and that frequency will be in the infrared range of the micro uh, of the electromagnetic spectrum. And once again, you won't be able to see that. But it just turns out, as it happens, that there are four transitions. Six, five, four, three, two. And I'm not drawing them spaced the way I should. So this is two, three, four, five, six. They, they should, of course, be more closely uh, spaced the higher you go up, because that's what happens here. This is two, this is three, this is four, this is five, this is six, getting closer and closer. But I've, I've ignored that bit. And it just so happens that if you go six to two, five to two, four to two, and three to two, those energy gaps, which are gonna, when the electrons fall, they give off a photon, the photon will have the energy which is represented by the difference between the two energy levels. That equals h times nu, so you can calculate the frequency. Just so happens that those four energy differences yield light in the visible region. And in fact, if you look then at um, a photographic plate, you will find that there will be four lines that will be produced, a red, a green, a blue and a violet line, and they should be very sharp because these are well-defined uh, energy um, intervals, and each energy interval will give you a precise frequency so you get a very precise line. And that's the Bohr model, and that is indeed what you see. In fact, that spectrum had been obtained long before this model was even known about. So you already had, as it were, the experimental verification of this model long before um, the model was produced. And you might think that's it, but it isn't, because on closer inspection of this spectrum, what you find, for example, is that the red line turns out not to be a single line at all, but a doublet, two lines that are very, very close together. And the atomic um, explanation of this, the atomic physics explanation of this says, that in the Bohr model, we were only interested in the n equals one, two, three line. We had completely forgotten, uh, well, we didn't even know about, this is, this is really what has introduced the idea that there must be other quantum numbers, in particular, the L quantum number, which determines whether you've got an S, P, D, F, or so on orbit. And what that red line, which, which is producing the doublet is, is doing, is showing that if you've got an electron that has been excited to the 3s level, where s is, of course, l equals zero, the 2p levels are split. These are both p levels, but they are split. And I'll show you why in a moment in nuclear physics terms rather than atomic physics terms. 
And so you can have a transition of an electron falling down to the higher 2p level or falling down to the lower 2p level. And that will give you slightly different energies, which will give you slightly different frequencies. And that's why you get this doublet very close together, representing the difference between whether the electron falls to the slightly higher 2p level or the slightly lower 2p level. What we shall find is that the 2s level doesn't split, but the p levels and above do. And we now turn to nuclear physics to try to establish why. And what we're going to be talking about is the orbital angular momentum quantum number and the spin angular momentum quantum number somehow joining, coupling, to produce some kind of effect that is going to cause that splitting. And uh, you'll also remember that I told you in an earlier video that there is a total angular momentum for each nucleon, which is simply the combination, it's the vector combination, but let's keep it simple, of the orbital angular momentum and the spin angular momentum, and that is called J. Now, if you go to my video on particle physics, it's particle physics three, angular momentum spin, and I can give you the time, 35 minutes and 49 seconds in, you will see that I will derive an equation which says that L squared is equal to M max squared plus MM. Or if you like, MM into MM plus one. And MM max is the maximum orbital angular momentum. So for our purposes, we could rewrite that as L squared in this L plus one. L is the angular momentum operator in quantum mechanics. L is the angular momentum quantum number. What this is essentially saying is, if you remember back to our quantum mechanics, we were saying that when an operator acts on an eigenvector, it produces an eigenvalue times the same eigenvector. Um, so essentially we say that an operator, let's call it M, acting on psi produces an eigenvalue m psi. This is an operator, this is a number. That is, if psi is an eigenvector, m is called the eigenvalue. L is an operator, and if you square it, that is the operator, that's the eigenvalue. When you apply L squared, you get L into L plus one. I just wanted to refer to that. You can see the explanation for that in the quantum mechanics video. And it also follows that J squared is the total angular momentum um, quantum operator, and that is J into J plus one. And just to complete it, S squared, where S is the spin operator, is S into S plus one. Incidentally, for completeness, I should actually put that there are h bar squareds after these terms here. So let's put those in. So let's do a little bit of uh, simple maths. J equals L plus S. In other words, J is the combination of the uh, ang orbital angular momentum and the spin angular momentum. So J squared is going to be L squared plus S squared plus two L S, which means rearranging that L S is going to be J squared minus L squared minus S squared divided by two. And what I am going to assert is that this LS term, this combination of the orbital angular momentum and the spin angular momentum, is going to somehow be responsible for causing a splitting in some levels, but not, as I said before, the S level. Yes to the P, the D, the F, and so on, but it won't do it for the S level. And we'll see why in a moment. So that means that this LS term is equal to J squared, which is j into j plus one h bar. So it's j into j plus one. I'll leave the h bar to the end because all of these are gonna have h bar terms. Minus l into l plus one, minus s into s plus one. And all of that is gonna be h bar squared over two because these terms all have h bar squareds. And ls is this divided by two, so there's the two. Now I can actually work out what S 
into s plus 1 is, because s is a half. So this will be a half times 3 halves, which is 3 quarters. So this term will always be 3 quarters, so it's minus 3 quarters. Now let's look and see what happens when L is 0. So that, that is the s orbital. When L is 0, the s orbit orbital, Ls will equal, well if L is 0, J will be a half because J is 1 plus S, is L plus S, and L is 0. So J just becomes S, S is a half. So it's a half into half plus 1, minus L is 0, so this term is just 0, minus 3 quarters because we've evaluated that. This is a half times 3 halves because a half plus half is plus 1 is 3 halves. Half times 3 halves is 3 quarters, minus 3 quarters is 0. So when L is 0, when you've got an s orbital, the Ls term, the, uh, the spin orbit coupling term, is 0. It has no effect. But now let's consider what happens when L is greater than 0. Then J will have two values. It, can either, it will be L plus S, of course, which means it's either L plus a half or L minus a half. Those are the two values of J. Because spin will either be plus a half or minus a half. And for any given L, there will be two values of J. And what I want to do, first of all, is to look at what the Ls term is, this term here, when J is L plus a half. So this is for j equals l plus a half, and then later we'll do it for l minus a half. So, if we look at this equation here, we've got j, which is l plus a half. So this is l plus a half into j plus 1, which is l plus 3 over 2, minus l into l plus 1, minus 3 quarters, because that's s into s plus 1. And that's going to equal L squared plus 3 quarters plus half L plus 3 halves L is plus 2L minus L squared minus L minus 3 quarters. L squared minus L squared 3 quarters minus 3 quarters 2L minus L is L but let's not forget that all of this had an h-bar squared over 2 at the end of it. h-bar squared over 2. So this is h-bar squared divided by 2. So the spin orbit coupling term is L h-bar squared over 2. It's a positive term. And if that's going to contribute to the energy, it means it pushes that energy down. Here is the potential well. If we're talking about, let's say, L equals, L equals 1, that's a p-level. If the p-level would be there, if it would be there, then there's a spin orbit term that is going to depress it still further. So it actually comes out there, a little bit lower, because of this positive term here. If it's positive, it's going to make the um, energy a little lower. It's going to be even more tightly bound, in other words. So the P level, when L is 1, or indeed any level above uh, L is 1, 2, 3, so on, you're going to get this L plus, L plus a half term is going to depress it a bit. But remember, it didn't happen for the S level because there's no spin orbit term. So I've rewritten the LS coupling term, J, J, J plus 1 minus L into L plus 1 minus s into s plus 1, which we've evaluated as 3 quarters. And now I'm going to say what happens if j is l minus a half. Last time we did l plus a half, now we're doing l minus a half. And in that case, the spin orbit term is going to be l minus a half into l plus a half. That's j, which is l minus a half, into j plus 1, which is l plus a half, minus l into l plus 1, minus 3 quarters, all multiplied by h bar squared over 2. And that's going to be L times L is L squared, minus half L plus half L, that goes, and then minus a half times plus a half 
is minus a quarter. Here you're going to get minus L squared minus L minus three quarters all times h bar squared over two. Well, the L squareds will go. Minus a quarter minus three quarters is minus one. So you've got minus L minus one, which is minus L plus one h bar squared over two. And that's the spin orbit coupling term when you have j equals l minus a half. And if I can remind you that the spin orbit coupling term for j equals l plus a half, I'll remind you it was plus l h bar squared over two. And what we said was that if you look at the potential well, here is the p term that you think is going to be there. That's, for example, l equals one. That's a p term. This was a positive term and therefore it depressed that value by that amount. This is a negative term. That means it's going to have less contribution to the potential well. So that's going to push this up. And so we've now got from one level, the effect of this spin orbit coupling term is to create um, when you've got L plus a half, you get a contribution that deepens the potential well. And when you've got L minus a half, you've got a cont contribution which, um, as it were, raises the potential well. And so you've got split levels. And that's why you get those two levels um, for the uh, P orbital. So, for example, when L is one, which means you've got a P orbital, You will get a split. And what will the values of those be? Well, this will be the L minus a half and this will be the L plus a half. So L minus a half is one minus a half is a half. Here you've got L plus a half, one plus a half is three halves. So the P levels will split into a half and three halves. When L is two, that's the D level. That two will split. The lower level will be L plus a half, which of course is going to be five over two. And the upper level will be L minus a half, which is three over two. When L is three, that's the F level. That splits into two levels. The lower level is the L plus one, remember. L plus one is going to be three and a half, which is seven over two. Uh, the top is going to be L minus a half, which is three minus a half is five over two and so on. You can see the pattern emerging. And that explains, I hope in a little more detail, the effect that I showed in the shell model video. The problem was that when people were developing the shell model, you'll remember in that shell model video, I showed that experimentally magic numbers were obtained where with a certain number of nucleons or a certain number of protons or a certain number of neutrons in a nucleus, they were very tightly bound. Very high energy was needed to get them out. And that occurred at certain magic numbers of values for Z proton number or N neutron number. And the problem was that no matter how you fiddled about with a nuclear potential, we've got a square well here, you could perhaps develop one which was like that. No matter what you did, you couldn't get that shell model magic number series. But once you introduce the spin orbit coupling term, the shell model magic numbers fall out. And finally, just to remind you that for each of these values, you're going to get um, a certain number of electrons that can occupy those uh, shells. Where you've got a half, that means that the only options are a half and minus a half, which means you can get, I'm talking about electrons, same goes with protons and neutrons, you can get two. If you've got a three half level, that means you can have three halves, one half, minus a half, or minus three halves, each of them separated by one unit, they're units of H bar, of course. And that means you now can get four electrons or four protons or four neutrons 
in a three over two level. Five over two, I think you're going to get the point, is going to go five over two, three over two, one over two, minus one over two, minus three over two, minus five over two, all separated by one quantized unit. You can get six electrons, protons, neutrons, or so on in there. And so if we look at this level here, what you find, of course, is that the total number of, uh, let's keep it with nucleons, neutrons or protons, the total number of neutrons, protons, you can get in a particular level is the top number in the fraction plus one. Five plus one is six, three plus one is four, one plus one is two. So you can go along here and say, how many, uh, how many um, protons could you get in the three over two level? Four. How many can you get in the one over two level? Two. Four plus two is six. Six is what you'd expect to get in a P level. In a D level, you'd expect to get 10. And in an F level, you'd expect to get 14. Let's just see if that works. In a five over two level, you can have six. In a three over two level, you can have four. Oh good, six plus four is 10. What about this? In a seven over two level, you can have seven plus one is eight. In a five over two level, you can have five plus one is six. Eight plus six is 14. It works. You don't get more protons and neutrons per level, but you do get them, let's be clear about this one, this is four plus two. You do get them split in this proportion between the lower L plus one and the upper L, sorry, L plus a half and the upper L minus a half level, which is contributing to the overall spin orbit coupling and that spin orbit coupling to, is responsible for splitting these levels.